Yes, they eat the same food, look the same, have the same religion, speak kind of the same, and have the same general historical roots. But do not call these people Ethiopians. It's time to learn geography now! Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbie. Did you know that Italy tried to take over parts of Africa? Yeah, and it didn't last that long and it didn't end very well. But it happened. But first... Eritrea prides itself on its location, and here's why. Eritrea is located on the Horn of Africa on the east side, bordering the Red Sea to the east, bordered by Sudan, Ethiopia, and Djibouti. In addition to the mainland domain, they also administer the Dalak Archipelago, just off the coast, consisting of 124 small islands, only two of which are permanently inhabited, Nora and Dohul, as well as a few of the Hanish Islands that they had a huge dispute over Yemen with, and the South Red Sea Islands in the south. The country is divided up into six regions, with the capital and largest city, Asmara, located in the central Makel region. The country operates five main airports, the largest ones being Asmara, and the former capital when it was under the Italians, Massawa off the coast. Although Eritrea has the second largest coastline along the Red Sea after Egypt, not many people live there. Other than the cities of Massawa and Asab, most Eritreans live inland, especially in the areas surrounding the capital. This is partially due to the fact that, like some other countries we'll cover in future episodes, Eritrea has a generally dry and inhospitable coast. I mean, the South Red Sea region is kind of classified as one of the hottest areas on the planet. Nonetheless, they take their coastline seriously. When you own land along one of the busiest trading routes on the planet, you tackle that bad boy and tear it like a boss. I mean, unless your constituents kind of start hating you and then they put up an embargo, but hey, they'll come crawling back. They even set up camp and even have an exclave on the southernmost border with Djibouti on the Dumaira Peninsula because they were like, we want to get as close as we can to the Bab al-Mandab Strait. Home to quite a few archaeological sites like the ones in Kohaito, Matara, and Sanafe with the Aksumite ruins, many of which are yet to be explored, as well as a plethora of centuries-old churches, monasteries, mosques, and mausoleums hidden along the cliffs on the outskirts of towns. The point is, with whatever land that they do have, they work to the best of their ability to feed their ever-growing population. Let's explain. Now, yes, as mentioned before, many of the places in Eritrea's coast are generally hot and dry, which, to no surprise, is why the camel is actually the national animal. But that's only one part of the country. Surprisingly, they have quite a contrasting land makeup. Just like we mentioned in the Djibouti episode, the general area that Eritrea is located in is a hot mess when it comes to three tectonic plates, the Somali, African, and Arabian. All three of these converge into an area known as the Afar Triangle. Basically, the land is tearing itself apart. Eritrea is located right at the fork of the East African Rift, including the Danakil Depression, shared with Ethiopia being labeled as the hottest place on earth. Therefore, the rift creates coastal highlands. The results looks like a backwards rain shadow effect in which the coasts are dry and hot and the inland areas are fertile and green. This is also why the majority of the population lives inland. In addition, this gives Eritrea a few volcanoes, most of which are Holocene and extinct, but then again, Nabra was thought to be extinct until it kind of went buck wild in 2011. Inland, you can find a range of landscapes from subtropical rainforests like the ones at Filfil, or you can find green precipitous cliffs and canyons in the southern highlands. Despite the lush interior, there still is an issue with desertification and drought. The entire population is required by law, starting at age 15, to take a month off and terrace hillsides with rocks to prevent erosion and hold in moisture. 80% of the people live off of agriculture, in which crops like barley, beans, lentils, sorghum, and the interestingly small grain teff is grown. Animals thrive in many parts of the country, especially in the lush interior regions. Over 500 different species of birds can be found, as well as mammals like warthogs, aardvarks, hares, gazelles, and hyraxes. In terms of predators, Eritrea seems to have more canine species than feline. Wild dogs, golden wolves, and jackals, and hyenas dominate the highlands and plains. Resource-wise, Eritrea actually has a pretty decent diversified economy. However, two things they thrive off of are livestock and gold, specifically sheep and goats in the livestock. Gold has actually been mined here for centuries and makes up about eh, 15 or so percent of the exports. Eh, hold on to your horses though. Even though they have a lot of gold, they still have quite a ways to go in terms of economic development, which gets a little controversial. Let's, uh, let's discuss that in. Okay, so like mentioned before, Eritreans and Ethiopians will admit that they both have incredibly similar cultures, traditions, belief systems, and even language structures. In every reasonable sense, they are kind of like cousins. However, do not call Eritreans Ethiopians. First of all, the country has about 6.5 million people and has doubled its population since the 1990s. The country is made up of nine distinct ethnic groups, the largest ones being the Tigrinya at 55% and Tigre at 30%, and the remainder come from groups like the Saho, Kunama, Bilen, Rashaida, and others. Eritrea is one of the only two countries that uses the only indigenous African writing system in the world that's still used, which by the way, side note, an Abu Gida is an alpha-syllabic writing system similar to Arabic and Hebrew that incorporates consonant vowel clusters into syllable character units. The word Abu Gida even came from four letters of the Giz alphabet, A, Bu, Gi, 
and da. So basically, if you want to write something like the word house, it would kind of look something like this. The writing system is used primarily to write Tigrinya, Tigray, and Amharic in Ethiopia. All three languages are pretty similar, and if they listen really hard, Eritreans and Ethiopians that speak these languages can kind of understand each other enough to get by. It's kind of like Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese. Now here's the thing, when Eritreans and Ethiopians meet each other, the first question they typically ask is, are you Habesha? And then they ask which country they're from. So what exactly is Habesha? Habesha people are incredibly unique Semitic mixed African peoples that can only be found in this area. Over millennia, Semitic peoples have mixed in and created this beautiful new group of people found nowhere else, the Habesha. A little bit over half the population adheres to Christianity, predominantly the Coptic Eritrean Orthodox Church, whereas the majority of the remaining population is mostly Sunni Muslim. They also use the Type C plug outlet, they drive on the right side of the road, and the currency is the Nafka. Now, because of the Italian occupation, Eritrea kind of has like a little bit of an Italian twist to it, where some of the buildings and shops have clearly influenced architectural styles. Pizza shops, cafes, and cappuccino and espresso are all over, and many of the residents, especially the older generation in urban areas, can actually still speak and understand Italian. Okay, now this is where the distinctions are really gonna start to come out. Let's talk politics. Eritrea kind of gets a bad label from the West because of some of the harsh policies that the government adheres to. Some even have gone so far as to label it as the North Korea of Africa. In the simplest way I can put this, the modern day area of Eritrea was most likely the site of the ancient land of Punt. Fast forward after centuries of other empires and nations taking over until they finally got their independence from Ethiopia in 1993. Guys, I'm on a time constraint. We don't have time for full historical lessons. Just look it up yourselves. Basically, to this day, Isaias Afwerki has been the president since independence in 1993, and the country operates in a strange one-party system that has, how can I put this, rather intense social policies? Everybody, male or female, are required to serve military conscription by the age of 18 and continue with national service. It's estimated that about a third of the country's military in the war against Ethiopia were actually women. Originally, national service was supposed to be for 18 months, but the policy changed and now it's kind of like an indefinite amount of time until the government deems complete. This has been a huge hotbed of controversy for many of the citizens since some have ended up serving for years and really have no say in it. This has also caused quite a few Eritreans to leave on a daily basis to avoid the conscription laws. The government defends itself by saying that they strongly emphasize the strength and wealth of a unified nation that works moving forward together. This is also one of the reasons why Eritrea doesn't accept most forms of foreign aid, believing that handouts will enable the citizens into an unhealthy dependency. The government has actually kind of done a relatively good job at prioritizing the national budget towards education and health, though. This has, in return, helped them reach their goals of essentially eradicating polio and most cases of malaria in the entire country. The problem, though, is that there's almost no economic movement, especially in the private sector, with an average annual income of around $600 a year. So essentially, the people are fairly healthy, but poor. Cycling is a popular sport out here though, and they actually host one of the most difficult routes in the world, the Asmara Karen Road. A lot of people from all over the world like cycling that road for some reason. Let's talk more about the people who are uh, kind of interact with this country, shall we? Eritrea is kind of, well, if we're gonna be completely honest, let's just say they kind of isolate themselves a little bit. They've made enemies with pretty much all of their neighbors, you know, with battles and border disputes and wars with all of them, even Yemen. However, recently Sudan has been kind of fixing up things a little bit, but they still have some issues. This means that they kind of have to look outwards for diplomacy. Now here's the most confusing circumstance. For some reason, they are friendly with both Israel and Iran? The president has gone to Israel for medical treatments and conducts business with them well, but also has visited the president of Iran and has made friendly ties with them. But they are also an observer state of the Arab League. So essentially, they do have some friends, but they just can't be in a room with all their friends at the same time. Some Eritreans might say that on a fiscal level, Qatar and China might be their close friends, but not necessarily their best, since they've invested heavily in their commerce and business. It's complicated. Their best friends are kind of themselves, honestly. In conclusion, yes, Eritrea has some issues, no denying that, but it's also a land overflowing with deep ancient history infused with Semitic African influences, coastal sea lovers, with a few leftover shavings of Italian spice mixed in there. And that's, that's pretty unique, isn't it? Stay tuned, Estonia is coming up next.